The Democracy That Delivers podcast is brought to you today by the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center at SIPE. This is the podcast where we talk about corruption in its many forms. And now to your host, Frank Brown. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Democracy That Delivers podcast from the Center for International Private Enterprise, or SIPE. My name is Frank Brown, and I head up the Anti-Corruption and Governance Unit here at SIPE. And the Center, the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center, or ACGC, is very happy to bring you this edition of the Democracy That Delivers podcast and feature a very special guest joining us from New York City, Christina Ritter, who's the head of governance and anti-corruption at the UN Global Compact. Welcome, Christina. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for inviting me to this podcast. It's great to have you here. For listeners, I wanted to give a little background of Christina's resume and what she's done before joining the UN Global Compact. So Christina's an attorney at law, and she specializes in business administration. Prior to joining the UN Global Compact, she worked for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, or UNODC, where she provided technical assistance in various continents on the international standards and tools to address corruption and money laundering. At UNODC, Christina was designated Global Coordinator of the Integrity Component of Crim Just, which is a UNODC flagship program against drug trafficking. In this context, she engaged with Chambers of Commerce, Compliance Association, private sector entities, and companies in over 20 countries to promote business integrity. So, Christine, I wanted to, to jump in right away and just have you tell us a little bit more about your background, the business connection here we're sensing, business integrity dimension, and that obviously relates very directly to SIPE's work. But could you talk a little bit about how you landed at the UN Global Compact and how long you've been there? Yes. So as you mentioned, I currently work as the head of governance and anti-corruption at the UN Global Compact since December 2022. So I have been here for almost two years. And prior to this job, I spent almost nine years at the Corruption and Economic Crime Branch of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, or UNOEC. Um, UNOEC is the guardian of the UN Convention Against Corruption. I started there at the regional office for Central America and the Caribbean in Panama, and eventually moved to headquarters in Vienna. And at UNODC, I had the pleasure to work on all aspects of anti-corruption and with different actors, from children to justice operators, anti-corruption authorities, civil society, and of course, with the private sector. So that was uh, an amazing experience. And before my time in UNODC, as you pointed out, I worked for the private sector. So I started my career as an attorney, spent four years in a law firm, then I left to study my MBA and worked for four more years as head of business management and legal affairs in a company. So that's my professional background that took me here. Geographically, where I come from, I'm Panamanian. I was raised in Canada, in Montreal specifically. Well, that's a little bit about me. Super. It's always really helpful to be able to place our guests in some sort of context. Um, and it's it's really useful to understand that you came from the private sector originally and transitioned into the UN universe. I think it would be helpful for listeners if we could get a little bit of a description about the UN Global Compact, what its mission is, and where you fit in with your hat of governance and anti-corruption into the UN Global Compact unit, if you don't mind. Sure. So the United Nations Global Compact, in short, it's basically the office of the UN that works with the private sector. So it is the largest corporate sustainability initiative in the world with over 25,000 participants and presence in 162 countries. So it's basically um, for companies that wish to commit to higher standards in four areas, labor, human rights, environment, and anti-corruption, as well as other cross-cutting issues such as good governance and gender. So that's how I, I fit in to the programmatic unit of the Global Compact. I'm the head of one of those four main areas um, that we work on. Thank you. And, and one of my questions I always ask for anybody who engages on the part of a multilateral or an NGO with the business 
community is how do you incentivize their involvement with the UN Global Compact? In other words, what's in it for them? What's in it for, for businesses? Okay, so we work with our participant companies through our value proposition that translates basically into four engagement opportunities that we call connect, lead, learn, and communicate. So we connect with them mainly through our country networks across the world. These are basically created when global compact participant companies in one country, they come together, they organize, and then they create this country network. So from headquarters, we work both with companies directly on some topics, but a lot of our work goes through our country networks when we want to roll out a training, for example, or convene companies from different countries for a consultation. So we we use our country networks for that. And also our regional hubs across the world. These really help us have a sense of the context on the ground. Um, and another way of connecting is through our relevant conferences, where we can discuss challenges, trends, solutions. So for example, our flagship event is the Leader Summit and it takes place every September in New York. Then the second engagement opportunity is to lead. So connecting at the national, regional and global levels. Uh, Like I said before, that gives us a sense of the priorities we should be focusing on. So we work on amplifying the voice of the private sector so that those priorities are heard um, in spaces where policies, strategies, or legal frameworks are being adopted. And this way, we help companies have an impact in the ecosystem where they operate. We also make sure that their perspectives are represented in the global anti-corruption arena and uh, at the regional level, in the regional platforms to fast track the UN Convention Against Corruption, but also at the national level through collective action. Another way that we can have our companies leading is through a delivery channel that we call the Think Labs, um, through thought leadership. And it's when we convene a group of champion companies interested in advancing a given topic and innovative together. Then in practice, the Think Lab holds several sessions to develop practical guidelines that we then disseminate around the world. Which takes me to our third engagement opportunity, which is learn. So when those guidelines or those standards are produced, we will turn them into capacity building deep dives or e-learning modules or train the trainer accelerator programs that we, like I said, promote um, through our country networks. And finally, our fourth engagement opportunity is to communicate. And this is very important because our participant companies, they have the obligation to publicly report on progress made around the four topics that I mentioned before, anti-corruption, labor, human rights, and environment. So this mechanism enables us to gather data by region, country, sector, size of the company, and therefore make evidence-based decisions that will guide our priorities and programming. This is really useful because I've only interacted with UNGC either at the very top or at the very bottom. So often when SIPE's anti-corruption unit is looking at beginning to work in a given country, we'll look at what UNGC companies there are in that country, because right away we know that they have an interest and a level of commitment to the same issues and concerns that we have. One thing I'm wondering is that we always examine our engagement with the private sector in terms of carrots and sticks. So we're looking to understand why a company might work with us, with SIPE. And so as you describe all the different ways that companies can engage, are those all carrots? They're all, all opportunities? Or is there an enforcement element to what UNGC does or a sort of certification dimension where you're either on, you're certified or you're not? Or is this entirely carrots? It's all, it's all opportunities for, for business when it comes to the UNGC. It's opportunities for business. We do have an integrity unit that carries out due diligence, for example, on companies. But to be honest, we don't have the capacity to watch 
the over 25,000 participants. So um, that's why we require from them to publicly report on an annual basis through our communication on progress mechanism that I mentioned before, uh, what they are really doing to progress and, and move forward in, in their commitments to the global compact. But if a big scandal, for example, comes to us and we're able then to investigate and, and find out that the company is not really pursuing are their commitments, then we have the ability to, I guess, invite them to resign from the Global Compact. But yeah, we're not really a, a watchdog. We also rely on, I guess, civil society, the public in general, to be able to watch and, and read those reports to see what the companies are doing. And we can take measures, yeah, sometimes, but not on a daily basis, I would say. That makes sense, because it, it takes an extraordinary capacity to provide that level of oversight for 25,000 participants. And just picking up on one thing you mentioned, has there been an instance where you did have to invite a company to resign from the Global Compact? I mean, personally, I, I haven't. As I said before, I'm quite new here. I started last year. Um, but I've heard of cases when, yes, um, after a big scandal, we, uh, I guess, have those conversations with the companies. One other question I had was, so in our experience, we're, when we're engaging with the private sector, with the business community in a given country, the, the needs related to anti-corruption compliance, especially of an SME, of a small business, versus the needs of a multinational are very different. And so I'm wondering how you reconcile those different sets of needs by your 25,000 participants, is it a big enough tent to accommodate everybody? Or do you have separate programs? Or how, how do you do that? Yes. So actually, 65%, I believe, are of our constituency are SMEs. So yes, every programmatic area needs to be mindful of, of that when we produce those guidelines that I mentioned before, the trainings, the capacity building opportunities. And recently we've launched a program specifically for SMEs called Spark. So we're moving forward with that. And we have programs called the Accelerators. Soon next year, hopefully we will be able to launch an accelerator on business integrity that will definitely take into account the size of the companies and really help them identify the risks that are proper to the size of their companies and the mitigation measures that they can take uh, consequently. One of the first times that we actually engaged with the UN Global Compact in a meaningful way was at the COSP, which was held in Atlanta in late 2023. And you played a critical role in the first ever private sector forum that was part of that COSP. And so I wanted to ask you if you could describe for listeners a little bit what a COSP is and what the UN Convention Against Corruption is and how the private sector has had a growing role in that long-time global movement. Sure. So, yes, last year was a big year for our portfolio. Um, so the Conference of the State Parties to the UN Convention Against Corruption, or COSP, um, its, its acronym, is the main most important global conference on anti-corruption in the world. It's basically a meeting of all the countries that have ratified this convention. So almost every country in the world, they come together every two years in a different location to discuss the challenges, the priorities of implementing anti-corruption measures and ultimately commit to specific solutions, priorities through resolutions. So most people are familiar with the climate cup, which happens every, every year. This one is the anti-corruption COP, and it happens every two years. 
So last year, it took place in Atlanta. It always happens in December around the International Anti-Corruption Day, which we celebrate every 9 December. It was very special last year because they were celebrating the 20th anniversary of the UN Convention Against Corruption. So for us, it was really a, like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that we saw to bring the voice of the private sector to that conference. So we started preparing for that um, in September at our Leaders Summit, where we asked companies to develop a call to action from business to governments. And so we, we basically worked on that, drafting a high-level one-pager document with five priority areas where we want governments to focus their anti-corruption and governance efforts. So the five topics that came up were related to incentives, more corporate sustainability criteria in government decision-making processes, collective action, the use of technology and AI, and um, some values, ethical leadership values in education. So that call to action, we opened that for signatures through October, November. SIPE helped us disseminate the call to action and our partners, they also helped us with that. In the end, in only two months, we had um, signatures from 91 countries around the world and we presented the call to action at the Anti-Corruption COP in December in Atlanta. Also, besides the call to action, we did host with the UN Office on Drugs and Crime the first ever private sector forum inside a COSP. And we did so with SIP and with other partners, almost 20 partners. And the idea started because the host country, which was the US, they told us at a very, very early stage last year that they wanted presence of companies. In addition to that, UNODC received so many requests for side events related to business integrity and anti-corruption in the private sector from different international organizations. So we decided to put them all under one umbrella, under one roof, which is a private sector forum. And so this event in the end lasted two days. We all worked together on the agenda. It was a major undertaking, but it was very successful. Why? Because we received a wonderful response from governments. Governments there recognized both the call to action and the private sector forum and adopted a resolution that committed 190 countries to adopt incentives for business integrity. It was Brazil who proposed the resolution, also sponsored by Norway and Saudi Arabia. But finally, it was adopted. So, so we were really happy to really receive that recognition and that instant response from governments. Now the challenge is really to translate that commitment at the global level to the national level. That's fascinating. And I, I think I had never been to a cost before, before I went last um, December in Atlanta. And I, at first I was a little skeptical, like what could this big unwieldy process offer for businesses, which are typically quite nimble, looking at short term frameworks and results. But what became clear after a couple of days on the ground was that all of these countries that had, had signed up to the uh, UN Convention Against Corruption, some of them are pretty rough places. They're authoritarian states with terrible corruption problems, but here they are making these commitments regarding the private sector. And so that's important to an organization like SIPE because when we start to work in these countries, we can cite those commitments as a, if nothing else, a conversation starter. Even if we don't have much optimism that something will change, those commitments are a place that we can start. And that, over the years as I've worked at SIPE, I begin to see the tremendous value of the UN Global Compact through that lens, that because it's so wide reaching um, and is so inclusive with 25,000 participants, as you said, that we can go pretty much anywhere in the world. And if nothing else, there'll be some commitments around that. Um, 
and we'll have some local allies in the private sector. Exactly. People sometimes, they, they ask me, okay, so this resolution is a kind of high level up there commitment. How do you, what do you do with that? How do you translate that into reality? And the truth is that that resolution helps us, like you said, to at least have the first the first conversation with the government because after they adopt th these resolutions, they have a commitment to report on what they're doing to implement the resolution. So there are meetings taking place in Vienna every year and then the COSP every two years where all countries that are uh, state parties of the convention, they must report on what they're doing. So this is a first step that really enables us to knock on the government door at the national level and tell them, look, you committed to this, let's do it together. We are here to, to help and to support you. And in fact, three months later, after the resolution was adopted in December, we launched a resource guide with UNODC and with the OECD to support governments to adopt incentives for business integrity and sanctions for wrongdoing. And we included an entire chapter on involving the private sector in this endeavor. So today, again, we are working now on, on trying to translate this resolution at the regional and national level. And something we did this year about that was very fantastic in Africa um, was was that UNODC has these regional platforms around the world um, meant to fast track the implementation of the UN Convention Against Corruption. Each of these platforms they comprises a group of countries that convene to select four to five thematic areas where they want to focus their anti-corruption efforts. So most of these regional platforms, they actually they have picked the engagement with the private sector as a priority area. UNOEC and the UN Global Compact join forces to bring companies for the first time to a regional conference of the platform for East Africa and Kenya. 25% of the participants came from the private sector and the rest were mainly anti-corruption authorities, government officials and civil society. So during four days, we co-drafted a roadmap with very concrete, specific actions to advance each thematic area, including the engagement of the private sector. And by the end of the week, the roadmap was endorsed. SIP was there, Trans for, uh, Transparency International and other partners also contributed to this. And I, I think it was a major achievement. So again, we have the commitment to the resolution at the global level. We reinforce it at the regional level through those platforms. And then we take it to the national level through collective action. And on this, the UN Global Compact, thanks to the Siemens Integrity Initiative, and now US funding too, has over 15 years of experience um, around the world that we have translated into a specific methodology to go about collective action against corruption. We, we have this in a playbook. You can find it on our website. And, and that's the methodology that we use. So collective action is a place where we often meet. And that has to do really with our efforts in Indonesia and in Thailand, Armenia, just to name a few places, to on a very grassroots level, gather together typically SMEs around a corruption issue that companies aren't comfortable addressing individually, but they will do so collectively together. Another place that we're intersecting with the UN Global Compact on corruption issues is around this new, relatively new State Department funded project called Galvanizing the Private Sector as Partners in Combating Corruption. And we're an implementer of this. OECD is an implementer. COST, the Infrastructure Anti-Corruption Group is an implementer. UNODC is an implementer, and then you are an implementer as well. And I'm wondering, Christina, if you could talk a little bit about that work, what your piece of the organizing the private sector or GPS program looks like. Yes, exactly. So we're all corruption fighters, and something 
beautiful about the organizations that work against corruption is I feel we are part of a tight community, right? And we see each other pretty often, actually, throughout the year um, in our different conferences, activities, and, and working together in the field. So, yes, we are all part of the galvanizing the private sector as partners in combating corruption initiative. Now, different organizations um, receiving these funds obviously have different projects and their own goals and targets, but we definitely aim at coordinating, finding synergies and avoiding the duplication of efforts. So for us, our project is called Uniting Leaders for Business Integrity. Uh, we are starting the second phase, actually. We are co-implementing with UNODC. And the first phase was basically around what I already mentioned at the global level. There was um, a big deliverable was the actual private sector forum that, that we achieved. The call to action was part of it. Uh, after COSP and after the resolution was adopted, we felt the need to be on the same page, governments and companies, on exactly what is business integrity, what deserves incentives. So this is important, obviously, to, to, to be on the same page and to establish. And so 10 years ago, there was a standard on programs of compliance and ethics for business that was developed by the OECD, the World Bank, and UNODC as mandated by the G20. After 10 years, this, um, this publication definitely needs some update. And that is something that we are doing this year with transformational governance lens. So that is also part of the project. We are bringing, I guess, those programs of compliance to an alignment with corporate sustainability frameworks through that Think Lab. And then we are also working, like I said, on collective action. Our two first target countries were Kenya and Uruguay, to give you a few concrete examples of what we're doing in those countries. Um, in Kenya, our country network has definitely become a leader, I would say, in bringing the voice of the private sector into the development of policies, strategies, and legal networks, legal frameworks, I'm sorry. They were involved, for example, in the drafting of the anti-bribery law, in its models, procedures, and also regulations, and recently, they have taken part also in the consultations for the new national integrity plan of Kenya. They have also a code of ethics that they're supporting aligned with these regulations for companies to sign up to. And in Uruguay, we're doing something similar. We're bringing, again, the voice of the private sector to the development of the first anti-corruption piece of legislation. So we are working there with the anti-corruption authority to make this possible. So in both cases, we're targeting the legislation, I guess, because we know that has an impact at, in the entire national level and especially when it requires from companies the adoption of compliance programs or integrity measures that makes a difference in the country. So that's what we are doing under those projects. And the second phase that we are now Starting will definitely include the institutionalization, hopefully, of a private sector forum from now on in every COSP. Next COSP will take place in, in Qatar in December next year. So I really hope, that if everything goes right, that we will have even a bigger and better private sector forum there with SIP and all of our partners. No, we're very much looking forward to it, especially now that I think we fully grasp the potential of the cost mechanism and the role that we can play. I wanted to ask you one last question, uh, Christina, that, that touches upon, I think, a, a moment of celebration that you had last month, September, in New York City. I think it was just before or after on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly. And that is the 20th, the celebration of the 20th anniversary of Principle 10. And colleagues of mine were there, 
and colleagues from all sorts of anti-corruption NGOs and governments as well, all were in attendance at this celebration in Manhattan. Could you describe a little bit what that was and what the significance of it is to the global anti-corruption community? Yes. So first of all, what is Principle 10? I explained earlier that companies that join the Global Compact, they commit to higher standards on labor, human rights, environment, and anti-corruption. Well, these four areas are translated into 10 specific principles. Principle 10 is the one that focuses on anti-corruption and literally states that business should work against corruption in all its forms, including extortion and bribery. So it's pretty simple. And so based on that principle, we call on companies to tackle corruption internally through good governance, compliance, and business integrity, but also externally, so across their supply chain, and finally, collectively, by engaging in collective action. So this year, indeed, we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of Principle 10, and on this occasion, we held a high-level event um, during the UN General Assembly Week in New York, convening leaders from the public and private sectors, as well as representatives of international organizations. I mean, all of our partners, civil society were there. Um, So the conference was divided into three segments because it was an anniversary, so past, present, and future. We started off with a really special session a dialogue between Mr. Peter Egan, who is the founder of Transparency International and the father of Principle 10, and Ms. Ivana Alvarado, a youth ethics ambassador of UNODC from Bayer, Mexico. We wanted to gather the perspectives of different generations on how the engagement of the private sector in the fight against corruption has evolved in the past 20 years. So while Mr. Egan focused on highlighting integrity paths as the best practice to fight corruption externally, Ivana emphasized the importance of a culture of integrity, the corporate purpose, and even mental health in the workplace for the recruitment and retention of talent. So I thought that was very, very interesting from the new generation. And then we started, you know, our three segments, past, present and and future. So to start off the past segment, we heard about one of the biggest scandals of the past decades, the Panama Papers. And then um, we had a panel that mentioned the former UN Global Compact Anti-Corruption Working Group as one initiative of the past that was very successful. So um, this group, this anti-corruption group, was once co-shared by TI on certain occasions, UNLEC on others, and it was active until 2016. It was really a pioneer in issuing some flagship anti-corruption guidelines that remain very valid today. For example, the corruption risk assessment methodology came from this group. And the idea came up for this group to be reestablished and meet at every COSP or Conference of State Parties to the UN Convention Against Corruption. Um, So this was very like one of the findings of the past segment that that I found very interesting and that we are currently scoping to see if we indeed reestablish this group and 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 adopt these meetings at COP every two years so that they can really establish a global business integrity agenda with all of our partners. Then during the present segment, we discuss the current priorities in this field. And what are the current priorities? I already mentioned them. We took them from the call to action and also from the work of the B20 Task Force on Integrity and Compliance. So this task force that was reestablished this year by Brazil, because it was canceled last year, um, has been working on recommendations for the G20, on a policy paper for the G20. Actually, this policy paper was completed. And next week, the B20 summit will take place in Brazil. And it's it's interesting because the priorities of the B20 are the same basically, priorities of the call to action. 
So we are very much aligned, again, incentives, collective action, the use of AI. Although one priority that they have that we did, didn't have in our call to action was precisely mental health in the workplace. So it seems like this is a very uh, innovative topic that we can easily connect to a culture of integrity, especially according to Divana Alvarado, who mentioned that the principal 10 event. And finally, we discussed the future segment. So what is coming up uh, for the principal 10 in, in the upcoming years? And the way we see it is that in the past two decades, the anti-corruption movement in the private sector evolved from mere compliance to a more holistic concept of integrity and beyond, because it's basically from doing what's legal to doing what's right. So this February, this year, we launched the Transformational Governance Corporate Toolkit available on our website. And we promote this transformational governance approach that takes into account this evolution that I just mentioned by merging traditional good governance or compliance as we know it with its typical 12 elements with sustainable governance, which addresses the impact that companies have on societies and on the environment. But then we take it one step further by calling on companies to also contribute to the ecosystem where they operate in line with SDG 16 on peace, justice, the rule of law and strong institutions. So that is what I was mentioning before, the, the Think Lab that is updating the, the standard on compliance and integrity with transformational governance lens. This seeks to address the new complexities and challenges that companies are increasingly facing. And coming to the forefront are matters related to corporate sustainability, regulations and reporting, the evolution of technology and artificial intelligence, of course, emerging risks resulting from geopolitical issues and co conversion crisis, to name a few. So in conclusion, based on the discussions of the Principal 10 event, priorities for us in the upcoming years will be to establish or institutionalize the private sector forum at COSP and hopefully reestablish this anti-corruption working group and also securing its presence at COSP to promote the adoption of incentives for business integrity at the national level, to support companies in their transformational governance journey, to explore the topic of AI and Gen AI and how it can contribute to business integrity, and perhaps how a culture of, of integrity influences mental health in the workplace, since we've been hearing so much about that. And we know that it helps recruitment and retention of talent in this new generation, which, according to our recent CEO study, is one of the main challenges that CEOs are facing today. So those are our priorities. This is a great way, I think, to wrap up the podcast. You brought us through the vision for the future, what the next steps will be, transformational governance, the role that the private sector will play. And I think it's safe to say that we hope to make parts of this journey with you, we being SIPE and the anti-corruption unit within SIPE. Christian, I wanted to thank you very much for taking some time out on a entry afternoon in New York City, where you're based. For the listeners, just as a reminder, this was the Democracy That Delivers podcast brought to you by the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center. And our guest today was Christina Ritter, and she's the head of governance and anti-corruption at the UN Global Compact. My name is Frank Brown, and I head up the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center here at SIP. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Frank. It was a true pleasure. And I know we will be working together on this issue in the future. So thank you for inviting me. Listen and subscribe to SIPE's Democracy That Delivers, wherever you get your podcasts.